let's let's get going. My name is Chris Ott. Um, I work as the as the deputy director uh, here at the High Speed Rail Alliance, and I wanted to welcome you all to this talk about better train service throughout the state of Illinois. Uh, we've had a lot of people uh, pre-register for this, uh, including some of our best supporters. But whether you've been with us for a long time or just checking this out for the first time today, uh, thank you all for coming. And, uh, and thanks especially go to our sponsor today, Siemens, uh, which has been a leader in this industry for more than 160 years. Uh, their work includes rail infrastructure and systems, as well as trains, uh, everything from trams to the high-speed trains that uh, more and more people want to ride today. Uh, and we also want to thank, uh, among our many guests today, uh, we have uh, a number of elected officials uh, and their staffers who work in branches of state and local government, uh, including some transportation agencies. If we were all in a room together, I'd ask for you know, some kind of show of hands from those people and some applause that doesn't work so well in Zoom. Uh, but people like this are in, a, in a, a unique position to help with the vision that we're going to describe today, and we thank them for their public service. Uh, for now, though, uh, until uh, the question and answer period, I will step back so that we can hear from our main speaker today, Rick Harnish. Uh, Rick has served as our executive director for more than 20 years, and today he is going to tell us about his vision for better train service in Illinois. Uh, Illinois is a state where Rick has made his home, and, and it's a state that plays just a critical role at the center of our national rail network. So Rick, please take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, I, and again, thank you to everybody for joining us today. Uh, for those who are joining us new, uh, the Alliance is um, a group of, of individuals, corporations, municipalities, um, who all seek to have the benefits of fast, frequent, and dependable trains. Uh, we strive to be the most uh, knowledgeable source, the go-to source on information on what high-speed rail is why we need to build it and what steps uh, local and state leaders can take to make it happen. Uh, we educate folks um, through a variety of programs like this. And then we give uh, local leaders and individuals, motivated individuals, the tools they need to educate their leaders, whether it be in state capitals or in, in Washington, DC. Um, the reason we do this is uh, excuse me. Our, our, our motivations are many, but but all kind of interrelated. Um, so most importantly, travel is important because it builds stronger ties between people. And in this country, we are very spread out with our kids going to college in one place, our vendors in a different place, um, our accountants may be in a different place. And the easier it is to travel, the stronger those relationships will be. And the better travel a community has, the more likely people will put down roots there because they can access the other things they need. So, and in the process, even though we'll be increasing travel because trains are so much more efficient than driving, we'll actually lower carbon emissions overall. Um, and there's a lot of resources that go into providing parking spaces, highway lanes, et cetera. Um, and the, by building some stronger, more walkable communities, you'll reduce the expenses of providing all of that infrastructure while actually increasing the tax base. Um, so it's a multifaceted and game-changing thing if we can make it happen. And the challenge is, how do we make it happen? Uh, today, we're going to talk specifically about Illinois, and to some degree, as a subset of that, more specifically, Chicago. Uh, Chicago plays, and therefore, as a result, because it's located in Illinois, Illinois plays a very unique role in building fast, frequent, and pa dependable passenger trains across the country, because it is, in fact, the hub of the nation's railway network. Um, in here, uh, there are in yellow, the places that you can take a one seat ride from Union Station to across the country in that kind of greenish is routes that really should be in place today um, and, and aren't. And I have forgotten it. I think it's 36 states today and something like 45 states 
if you include the missing pieces there that you can that have are directly related to uh, Chicago. So Illinois does play a very critical role in the national network. Um, the circumstances have changed dramatically in the last six months. So it, we used to be caught in a catch-22. Uh, states in the Midwest weren't being very aggressive about planning, well states around the country weren't being aggressive about planning because why pl plan for something that there isn't federal money for? And it was difficult to get federal money because the states weren't aggressively working on plans. Well, in the last six months that has changed because Congress um, through the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act did give a one-time advance appropriation that can be spent over five years of $66 billion for a variety of railroad programs uh, that are primarily for passenger rail. Um, High-speed rail is eligible for some of these funds, though we continue to advocate for the high-speed program uh, which exists but hasn't received money since 2010. Uh, we're continuing to advocate that money be added into the high-speed rail program, that money is specifically intended to go for high-speed rail. But on top of that 66 billion, uh, Congress act also, also authorized these programs for annual appropriations of just shy of 7 billion a year. And this is money that we have to advocate for on an annual basis, uh, but is there. So the point here being, we finally have a program that we can plan against and aggressively go after funding for, but we have to work together as a country on a national scale, regions, multi-state regions and state in order to make sure that we continue to use these funds well, get the additional funds um, and turn it into a program that lasts over time. So we can both think about the long-term vision and be planning for the long-term vision and taking steps by that while also having immediate wins where we get people into trains in the next couple of years. And every couple of years, we do some sort of expansion that gets more people into trains as we're designing the big stuff that will be truly game changing. And again, just to emphasize, you know, there can be fish in the lake and, and Congress put a lot of fish in the lake, but if you don't work to go out there and catch those fish and cook them, um, it really doesn't matter. And that's the stage that the states are in now of we've got to go out there and, and get this money and get the projects implemented quickly that, that we get money for and also launch the big picture long-term planning that needs to happen. And I'm going to talk about how that kind of fits together in Illinois. Uh, but the essential thing is we need to do that. And in order to do that, the rail division in, I, in Illinois needs to get bigger. It needs to grow very quickly, both the resources that it has for doing planning, but also the staff it has for planning and implementation. And we'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. Um, so before getting into the specifics, I wanna do two things. One is um, talk a little bit about the, the um, what high-speed rail is in terms of the bigger context in order to understand how this fits into the bigger Illinois picture. Two, give an example. Um, unfortunately, we have to talk about foreign countries when we talk about high-speed rail. So we'll talk about California as an example to lead to other things. Um, and then third, how these pieces fit together specifically in Illinois. And I wanna emphasize, these are our ideas, thinking points, but what we really need to do is create a consensus amongst Illinois leaders on how we're going to create a sustainable program, not while we're at, while each individual community or corridor is, is uh, fighting hard for the limited funds, also work together so that we create a sustainable program. So those are the three things we're gonna talk about today. First, um, High-speed rail, when done right, looks like a completely new technology from what we're used to with passenger rail in this country. Um, so in one respect, it is something completely new. 
But in the other case, it's actually just an evolution of railroad technology that's been in place for 200 years. And that gives you some flexibility in terms of how you design it, how you phase it, et cetera. The key thing is a couple of step points along the way. So if you wanna go faster than 90 miles an hour, you really need to separate the passenger, the lightweight fast trains, which could have freight on them, but they need to be very light. Um, you need to do separate those trains at 90 miles an hour. Um, and in this case, this is the new high speed line. I say new, um, it's been in operation for over 10 years between Milan and Bologna. Um, so this is the new high speed line that's pictured. The old line is a couple of miles to the east where they still have frequent passenger trains making a lot of stops and freight trains and other trains as well. Um, but we need to separate it about 90 miles an hour. Um, the 110 mile an hour service between Joliet and Alton that Illinois will do will be the exception to that rule, most likely. If you wanna go faster than 110, you really need to separate the roads um, from the tracks so that people don't drive in front of the trains or walk in front of the trains. We should be doing this on our busy lines anyway, um, especially um, through communities, uh, but by regulation, you have to do it to go faster than 110. You need to string overhead wires to go faster than 125. Um, probably to go faster than 90, you need a separate right of way, uh, not necessarily. And fencing is always a good idea. So these pieces can be put together in different ways, depending upon what your existing assets are and what your goals are um, in many different combinations. But to simplify the discussion, We've narrowed it down to shared use lines, um, which is what we think of mostly in Illinois today, where you've got uh, heavy freight trains sharing with passenger trains. This can work well with the right investment. Um, I, you know, I think BNSF and Metro would like to have separate rights of way, um, but the system does work very well between Aurora and Chicago. And that's because the investments were made in doing it right. And the challenge with long distance Amtrak service is that Congress just hasn't invested in the tracks to do that right. Um, but I envision about 80% of the Illinois network being on shared use lines. Regional lines is where you take a line, um, put it per preferably in public ownership and really focus it on passenger trains, but it's an old line, the Northeast corridor between Washington and New York um, would be a regional line. Um, and they're planning on going 160 miles an hour in some segments. So probably government owned, but not necessarily. And again, if you wanna go faster than 110, no highway grade crossings. Um, and then where the really game changing part comes in is building those new tracks to go 220 miles an hour. Some lines around the world today are being designed for 250. Um, most likely these will need to be government owned, but not necessarily. Um, and the interesting point here is typically in Europe, the high speed trains go anywhere that there's electrified wires. Um, that's probably not a reasonable thing to think about here. But certainly high-speed trains can use the regional lines to get into cities. So we don't have to build completely new into the cities. Um, it's really just out in the country that you're building completely new. So we need to have a long-term plan for Illinois to understand where we're going to do each of these pieces and at what time. Um, and that's a really critical piece. And I, I really want to thank um, Senator uh, Stottleman and Representative Moyland and Governor Pritzker for signing the bill that created the Illinois High Speed Rail Commission, so that which creates a forum for thinking about what that long term plan is that mixes these three types of infrastructure to connect the entire state. Um, and you really do have to have a big picture plan because most of our planning for railroads has been point to point. Um, and that's a problem because you're only looking like if you just look at Chicago and Indianapolis, there's only one opportunity to take that train. And there's been lots of studies, again, individually, 
um, of different routes, but none of them quite comes, gets across the finish line because you're not looking at the whole picture. So if you think about the whole network, all of a sudden there's a lot more opportunities to use that network. And in this case, maybe the new infrastructure is from Chicago to Indianapolis, and you can justify it because you've got all of this other stuff feeding into it. And then maybe this is a bus line, maybe this is a regional line, maybe this is shared use. We don't know because we haven't done that plan, but you really have to think on a, a network level, not a piece by piece level to really understand how this works. And buses can play a really critical role in making that happen in part. One way is by providing frequency in places where the, the infrastructure won't uh, support frequency yet or getting into the smaller rural communities um, that once you've got the whole network working at a better level, now we can provide bus service into smaller communities than what we have, have today. Um, so that's kind of the overall view. You have to have this big picture view. You need to have a network. You need to have frequencies in order to make this work. And you need to have a big picture plan. I think I've said that multiple times. Um, I talked about, let's look at an example. Um, and you know, we need to, the, California is 30 years ahead of Illinois on this. Um, so they really are the best place to look. Uh, they gain a lot of attention because their actual building a high-speed line got a, off to a little bit of a rough start. Um, and, you know, there isn't consensus yet that it's a good idea. I know that there will be consensus that it's a good idea once you can buy a ticket on it, but there's some more steps to get to. But I want to look just at their Amtrak network at this point. Um, and this is their Amtrak network. So you've got three Amtrak routes, the capital corridor up between Oakland and, and Auburn. Um, the uh, uh, surf liner down between San Luis Obispo, LA and San Diego. And then the one that's most relevant to Illinois is the San Joaquin, which um, I drove from Sacramento to LA one day to, to see the construction of the new high-speed line and was surprised how much I felt like I was in Illinois. If it weren't for the fact that there were mountains to the left and really dry um, soil, it, it could have been Illinois with, with the same kinds of communities that we have between Chicago and St. Louis or between Chicago and, and Carbondale. So um, in this, they're challenged because they have mountains where we don't. And you can see there's a couple of pieces missing um, in their Amtrak network. One is getting across a couple of really difficult mountain ranges. Um, they have already completed the environmental clearance for digging tunnels through the Tehachapis. And within the year, they'll have environmental clearance to get um, from the high desert down into LA. And they will have environmental clearance to get from Merced over to San Jose um, through the mountains there. Um, and then in the process of replacing this piece of the Amtrak line with their first segment of high-speed rail, um, that's under construction today. But the important thing is you can today, you can buy one Amtrak ticket and connect between these bus lines and these Amtrak lines to get anywhere in the state. Um, and that's a critical first step. We could do a much better use of buses throughout the Midwest. And that's something we could implement in the next year or two. It's just a matter of contracting with bus companies. Um, the next piece is the frequency. So again, I talked about how Bakersfield to Oakland looks a lot like, um, and Dave, if you could turn your camera off there for, for a little bit. Uh, um, Chris, can you turn his camera off? Yeah, yeah. trying to do that. <laughs> um, uh, Dave will be coming in to talk about what's happening in Springfield in a little bit. Uh, but Bakersfield to Oakland is about the distance of Chicago to Carbondale or Chicago to St. Louis. Um, and today, this is pre-COVID. You can see they had one, two, three, four, 
five, six, seven trains a day. Um, and this is working with the BNSF and the Union Pacific. Um, so it's, it's nothing special compared to what we have. And they had plans in place to add this 10 o'clock missing slot and then add an eight o'clock out on the end. So basically it's a very predictable schedule. And at two hours, you know, if you need to have a lunch meeting in Champaign and get back uh, to Chicago, you can do it um, as opposed to today, or actually when Amtrak, when the state and Amtrak restore the schedule, you have to wait till seven o'clock to get back and you might as well have driv driven home. So we should be focused on getting to a service pattern like this on all of the Amtrak routes radiating out of Chicago. Um, and then, as I mentioned, the first phase of high-speed rail will replace this segment. And instead of three hours, it'll be an hour and a half. And instead of eight to nine trains a day, it'll be 18 trains a day. And then all of the connections, all of the buses, everything sees a doubling in service as well. Um, and then the other important piece they did was they created this long-term plan. So they went out to 2040 and said, what train schedule do we need for 2040? What do we have to do today to get to that? And California is the only state that has done that so far. And this is what I would really like Illinois to start working on right now, is creating this long-term vision and then working back to what can we do next year? What can we apply for federal funds? What do we need to advocate for step-by-step? Step. And in this map, these red lines are high-speed trains. And if they're on, uh, if they're by themselves, they're on high-speed lines. And if they are with other colors, they are either on a regional line or a shared use line. So again, the trains are going much farther than the infrastructure, just like your car goes on the interstate and other places as well. And this demonstrates how important this network thinking is, because these are all of the counties and you've got rural counties up here in Northern California that today don't have much connectivity to the network. But by really changing the way the system works and the way people are using the system, it becomes possible to run much more frequent bus service to those rural communities. So you can see up here, up in the rural areas, you've got a lot more people using the system. So this really does connect the entire state together, not just the places that have train service. Um, we've, the FRA has started this process for the broader Midwest region, and they recently released a framework for planning a multi-state system. Um, the purple, green, and red um, are really high frequency service. So uh, Chicago to Minneapolis, St. Paul being uh, 24 trains a day, Chicago to St. Louis being between 16 to 24. Um, to get to that level of service, you do have to build at least significant sections of high-speed line. Um, but it's now up to the states to start figuring out the details of how to make this work. And I wanna point out um, their model does not include in any way uh, special economic features or rights of way issues or whatnot. The state's going to have to decide how to get between Chicago and St. Louis. And there are multiple routings um, that make sense to do that. But it's again, that's part of the role of the, the High-Speed Rail Commission is to figure that out. But one point here is it's a lot more trains coming into Chicago in a really congested network already. So what do we do about that? That's another question we need to have an answer for. So what I would like to see the state working towards is a network that looks something like this. And um, these colors represent the line that the uh, service would use, to, the metro route that the service would use to get into uh, Chicago. So for example, out uh, to Dubuque and Galena and Rockford coming in on the Milwaukee West uh, metro line. Um, coming out on Metro Electric to get to the south. Um, 
and the Rock Island to go to Peoria. And I would envision a starter service, um, which hopefully we can get started in the next couple of years. We've had funding available for it for 10 years, coming out through on the BNSF and going out to the Quad Cities. But to get to that you know, preferred service of every two hours, you really need to come in on a different route, perhaps on the Rock Island. And now you're starting, now we're starting to get to one of the other things we have to think about is how this infrastructure can serve multiple purposes. And that's difficult to do because Metro is primarily funded through the Federal Transit Administration. And the focus on FTA money in the past has been in very simplified terms, will this make the journey to work during rush hour faster for everybody, right? Which is not the philosophy we should be using. We should be, how does this infrastructure make it easy for people to take the train throughout the day for multiple purposes? Um, that's one of the changes we need to have happen. And then the FDA is focused on journey to work in large cities. But we should be focused on building the infrastructure that both does journey to work and throughout the day and allows people to access the, this service throughout this, the state. So that's kind of this first piece, getting from Chicago to Joliet. Similarly, these communities need a much better connection that's in this gray area between FTA transit money and the intercity money that goes uh, FTA, Federal Transit Administration, but there should be a much higher level of frequency here than there would be to the Quad Cities, for example. And then you've got Peoria and the Quad Cities coming on. So the way we do planning in this state today doesn't make it easy to add those things up. And that's one of the hurdles we have to get over. How do we add these markets up so that we can justify Redouble tracking this, perhaps putting in high high volume signals, compensating CSX and Iowa Interstate uh, for the additional costs that they will have from that. How do we make the finances of that work? You can't do it in the current planning process, but we have to get there. Um, and so we've got all of these routes that should be working on that. And then the other thing is where's this new high-speed line going to go? Probably based on the right-of-way, it uses Metro Electric or the uh, right-of-way to get to University Park. But from there, does it come down and split and go this way? Does it come over here and split? We don't know. We've not done any detailed analysis. We need to get that started right away and part of that context, uh, the br broader context. And then um, probably there should be a rail line that's connecting the Quad Cities over to Indianapolis. But again, let's get that service started with buses and meet every Amtrak train with a bus in each direction. That's one possibility for this. So if you think about this, if we have high frequency service and the connections are well-timed, you can use the train to go from Galesburg to Springfield or Peoria to St. Louis or LaSalle to um, you know, all of these different combinations that again, our planning the way we do it today doesn't add these up. And that's, that's what we need to get to. Um, so this is the Chicago to St. Louis line. We have had some very important successes um, over the last 20 years. Uh, the first being adding frequencies in 2006. Um, that demonstrated that frequency really does matter. Uh, the second is we completely rebuilt the railroad between Joliet and Alton. Uh, and this is a, a portion of that. Um, so we know how to do these projects in cooperation with the railroads. We already have experience with that. Um, and what the infrastructure should look like. So the safety of this line has gone way up because the improving grade crossings, the fencing, the better signaling, the better grade crossing signals, all of that, plus the line works a lot better for both freight and passenger. So this is, should be the goal for all of the Amtrak lines um, radiating out from Chicago. Now, 
We're not used to thinking at that scale because we've had to fight over pennies. We've got a program started at the federal level. Let's figure out how to turn this into a real program, a real program that we can phase this in over time. Um, and then getting closer in. So the closer you get to Chicago, the more frequent the service should be. So at least Galesburg, Moline, uh, Normal, Champaign-Urbana, that should all be every two hours, right? Closer in, we're getting into every hour. Within, and it's not quite this way, but to make it simple, within Cook County, it should probably be every half hour. And then within the city of Chicago, maybe every 15 minutes as you're getting closer into the city. Um, these, this is the basic metro network as it is today. Some of these lines are incredibly busy and it will be difficult to do that, but other of them aren't. Uh, but I just wanted to give some connection between those colors on the broader Illinois map and then how, how they're coming in. Um, and then there's a couple of key points that if we can connect these three points together, then that provides the connection. So all of the routes coming in are connected to those three big traffic generators. And that's O'Hare, Chicago, and McCormick Place. Um, so how does this work? I talked about how Metro's money primarily comes through the FTA and the downstate money primarily comes through the FRA. And it's very difficult to do these. Uh, but there is, there are a couple of examples of it working. working. One is the Northeast Quarter um, that has both FRA money, direct Amtrak appropriations, and FTA money going into the infrastructure there. I think more relevant to us is Caltrain between San Jose and San Francisco, where they took a line that several years ago um, looked very much like Metro today. Um, they did a massive upgrade to it in the late 90s to get to much more frequent service with diesels. Um, but now they're in the process of converting it to an electrified, super high frequency line. They will be shared between these new electrified trains um, and the high speed trains between San Jose um, and San Francisco. And because, again, they added those two uses together, they were able to put multiple pots of money together to make it work. Um, and this is the example we should be using to think about how we deal with getting the downstate trains into Chicago, getting much more frequent service within Chicago, and getting cross Chicagoland service so that you don't have to change downtown. Um, and then the other thing we need to do is look at our existing assets. And we've got a lot of them. Um, we do have some lines that aren't necessarily owned by the state, uh, but have little freight on them that can be upgraded. This one happens to be owned by Metra, a beautiful four track railroad uh, with some old signaling and old electrification on it. But if you upgraded it to modern standards could really haul a lot of trains. Um, and this could be a, a, the building block for everything south and east of Chicago. Plus you've got the CN next to it, which is where Amtrak is running today to Champaign, Memphis and New Orleans, that we could do a partnership with, Cham with the CN for in various ways um, in order to use that capacity as well. But there's others. We've got multiple train stations. We've got other routes with no little freight service. So we've got um, the Union Pacific owned line to Kenosha and to Milwaukee that has the ability to be expanded and has a couple of trains on it every once in a while. So we could really focus on that for the funnel coming from Wisconsin. So let's get from seven to 10 trains a day on the existing CP route and think about how to expand from there. And people have a hard time thinking of that because they go to different stations, but I'll talk about that in a minute. And then you've got this beautiful line going to Harvard um, that could be put to much better use with much more frequent Metro service and is pointed right at Madison um, and goes close enough to O'Hare to kind of be interesting for, for that service. Then you've got the Rock Island, which is owned by Metro and goes to Joliet does have freight on it, but 
is workable, and then the Metro Electric and the South Shore to South Bend. Um, and then I talked about these three key points, O'Hare, the Loop, and McCormick Place. And it is possible to assemble separate tracks for electrified trains next to the freight and diesel metro tracks so that you could have separate tracks linking McCormick Place through Union Station to O'Hare. We call that Crossrail Chicago. Um, that would be the thing that links the entire region together. So now it's possible to take a train from South Bend to O'Hare, from Kalamazoo to O'Hare, from Bloomington to O'Hare, and suddenly O'Hare becomes a much more attractive place to catch a plane to Paris, which means that the region is much stronger because we've got those better links internationally. Um, so that's one of the pieces of this puzzle. Um, to do that, a smaller piece of the puzzle is actually getting a station at O'Hare. This should be a top priority for the city, for the region, and for the state. Um, it is possible to do an interim station connected to the new parking garage they built. Kind of, this would be better than the not so good connection at, at Midway, much better, not quite ideal. Um, but on that, you know, let's do something today. Let's start running more trains to the existing station. Let's build a better station with a train every half hour and perhaps Amtrak stations. And let's today start planning the new high-speed tunnel that goes underneath the terminals. And you come up out of the escalator and you're in the terminals. Uh, so that's one very important piece of it that's shared by the entire Midwest region, not just by Chicago. The second one is A2. Um, and uh, in terms of the crossrail piece, there's also an important uh, uh, metro piece of the puzzle uh, called 75th Street SIP on the south side. Uh, but A2 is really a critical crossing point for trains coming out of Ogilvy and trains coming out of Union Station. It affects multiple routes um, and really it's coming down to, uh, there's a consensus that these, one of these, there's these four tracks coming from Ogilvy and the three from Union Station. There's a growing consensus that the four tracks from Ogilvy should fly over what should be four tracks out of Union Station at this point. Um, so that's a big piece of the puzzle. And then as part of that, you could also build a new station at Fulton Market. Um, which should be a top priority about where that train is, is located. The next piece of the puzzle that's critically important um, is adding a tremendous amount of capacity at Union Station, improving the, the safety there um, and the experience actually getting on a train. Um, those all go together. So what adds capacity also improves the safety and, and convenience because part of safety is getting people out of there faster if there should be an emergency. Um, there's been a plan in place to do this for about 10 years. Let's get cracking on getting it funded and, and getting the final design work so we can get this, again, it's well phased, let's get it done. Um, and then the other critical piece is this connection between uh, Union Station and McCormick Place that we call the 16th Street con Connector. Um, this in itself can be broken up into multiple pieces. Um, and then the most important piece of that is today, if you want, if you take a train from Chicago to Champaign, you back out of Union Station all the way over to Ashland Avenue, and then you come across and you don't really start going fast until you've gone underneath McCormick Place. Um, a new connection directly onto this, what is called the St. Charles Airline uh, makes it now possible for those trains. So that's an immediate step. A better connection here gets you on the Rock Island, um, headed towards Peoria, um, Moline, um, perhaps, uh, Bloomington Normal and Springfield. It also allows you to have an airport train that might originate at Blue Island and maybe make a stop at 35th Street, Union Station, Fulton Market, 
um, River Grove and out to the airport, right? Um, so now, instead of the airport train being focused on downtown, it goes into the south. And with a better connection over to the Metro Electric, those trains could also go to Hyde Park, Pullman, and um, someplace else on the south. Um, so again, though, we have to think bigger than just the few Amtrak trains a day that use this connection. Think about all of these different markets that, that are benefit from building a much better connection here. And one of the challenges in this is a, a good high quality station at or near McConnick Place. Again, we've got to get that planning work started and think really big. And then the little pieces of this, it really changes the way people use transit in the state. Um, and then in the interim, though, one of the assets we have is we have multiple stations. So the routes that have little freight on them tend to not point at Union Station. So before we build these connections, maybe we just start running more trains. And maybe we have uh, work with the CN to add uh, the second main back in which due to bad federal policy was taken out in the eighties, put that back in and run a train every two hours from Champaign to Millennium. It's an idea. I don't know that's what the consensus would be, but certainly I'd much rather have a train every two hours than just three poorly scheduled trains that, that go into Union Station. Um, certainly at Ogilvy, you could make those stations work as one um, with a walkway so that you would have departure boards in both stations. And maybe you have hourly service to Milwaukee and the one o'clock train to Milwaukee leaves from Union Station and the two o'clock leaves from Ogilvy. It's an opportunity we have, nobody's done any design work to see if it's feasible or not. But to kind of make the point, I overlaid the terminals at O'Hare over the existing terminal complex in Chicago and they're not that much different in size. So if we could figure out how to make it easy to walk from LaSalle Street to Union Station and figure out how to do undo the damage that was done when they tore down the headhouse of LaSalle Street in the 80s, maybe this becomes a way to add station capacity quickly. But I don't know. We should be worth looking at that. So I, I dumped a lot on you quickly. Um, I just wanted to get to a philosophy, throw out some ideas, because we need to start thinking much bigger. We need to start thinking out of, the, out of the box. What ideas can we use? How can we use our existing assets? We need to do this on a consensus basis across the state. That's going to be a challenge, but we've got the tool of the Illinois High Speed Rail Commission to do that. Um, uh, we do have a... Uh, uh, a little bit of a, a more in-depth overview, uh, still in very much in draft form. So if you find mistakes or have suggestions, please let us know. But if you go to hsrail.org slash Illinois, uh, a little bit of uh, more in-depth on what we were talking about today. And there's also a petition you can sign um, so that not only can you add your voice, but that list we're looking for ways that Illinois can make some immediate progress in the next year and have a huge success, and even in the next two years. Um, and we have funds available to get new service to Moline, to Rockford, and in, to improve service to Champaign. Those funds are available right now. Um, so we're working to understand what it takes to get those projects um, moving into the construction phase. Um, and so if you add your name to this petition, you'll also be on the list so that how we can uh, work with you on that. So the core philosophies are big plans so that we understand the pieces, adding markets together uh, through connectivity throughout, through a connection points like Champaign and Bloomington or at Union Station and O'Hare, um, multiple uses, high frequency, 15 minutes frequency within the city and less frequent as you get out um, at radiating out from the city. Um, so I want to bring Dave on to talk about a little bit about what's happening in Springfield right now. 
Um, and then we'll come on for questions. And boy, this went long, I apologize. I'm trying. <laughs> I'm trying, Rick, I can't get the camera to work. So. <laughs> okay, but well, we can hear you, so okay, let's, we can go. All right. Um, we are really riding on, in Springfield, we're riding on the success of the bill last year that Rick mentioned early in his speech that uh, sets up a high-speed rail commission. The governor is in the process of appointing uh, members of that, including the board president of um, High-Speed Rail Alliance, uh, Maurice Ball. Uh, we haven't got that defined yet, but they, IDOT is, is ready to go as soon as we get the, the board member's name. Um, the process and what we're doing this year is to try an appropriations bill. And for anybody not familiar with Springfield, uh, appropriations bill uh, introduced by anybody other than the chamber leader doesn't go anyplace. Um, but it is a, it's something to, to spark interest and tar start the conversation about additional needs uh, coming from a relatively small uh, area of the public, but something that uh, will be beneficial to all. So what we did is drafted a, a couple of bills. They're identical, Senate Bill 4174, House Bill 5695. Um, they set aside $3 million additional for the rail division of IDOT. Um, they don't have the capacity today to really do the expansion that Rick has really laid out in a very useful format. That's going to take a considerable amount of manpower at IDOT. So we thought as an initial point, $3 million to the rail division. The High Speed Rail Commission will be working somewhat independently. Uh, IDOT will staff it, but again, they don't have the current staff to do what they need to do already. So we put $5 million in, into the High Speed Rail Commission, and that will probably include money to the, uh, to do the statewide uh, passenger rail plan that looks not only at high-speed rail, but everything from uh, Metra and CTA to St. Louis's uh, uh, Metrolink uh, to all of the uh, public transit in smaller cities that would be served by passenger rail also. Um, Five million and much of that will probably be a contract probably with the University of Illinois College of Engineering they're one of very few departments in the country that have a rail division within their College of Engineering. And lastly, uh, we set aside $10 million in this uh, appropriations bill that would be used for engineering purposes. And Rick uh, mentioned the, the comment, it's never too early to be prepared. And that's what we're trying to do is to have access to engineering money that can go out in contracts so that, um, when the federal stimulus money starts coming, and we saw that there's $66 billion that will be coming over the next few years, if you have your engineering done already, um, it really speeds up the process and makes, makes your application for those competitive grants all that more, more effective if the state has actually gotten off the stump and, and got started on, whether it's um, additional service to Peoria up to Chicago, which is, uh, we think a highlight, uh, former Secretary of Transportation Ray LaHood is, is helping to lead a, a group in Peoria that's looking at uh, passenger rail north along the Illinois River and then turning east, uh, following the Illinois River into Chicago. Um, these are uh, projects that add impetus, they add momentum, whether it's construction on the Rockford uh, right-of-way whether it's getting the, the uh, plugs started on the Quad Cities um, passenger rail. These are all things that when one success is found in one city, it builds throughout the state. And that's what we're trying to do and be ready to support um, through the engineering dollars, all of these efforts that we're doing around the state. So that's kind of an update on Springfield. I'd be happy to answer any questions at the end. Excellent. Thank you very much, Dave. Um, I was looking through the questions real quick. Um, and there was a question about the Illinois State Rail Plan. Um, and the state rail plan, the official plan today has a very, very long and comprehensive list of proposed projects, including a new 220 mile an hour high speed line. 
um, linking Chicago, Champaign, um, Springfield, and St. Louis. Uh, there's that map that I showed of Illinois. There are, aren't, not everything is in there, but 90, 95% is in there. So what we're asking the state to do is start doing design work and start understanding how those pieces fit together in, in a feasible way, as opposed to having a, a list of, of projects. Um, and then there was another important thing that I saw I wanna make sure I get to. Um, I don't remember who it was, but I wanna be very clear, um, cities like Macomb really depend upon these trains. Um, and today there are two trains a day. Um, and then that's in part because of a coalition that we helped to lead and that our members were very successful in gaining additional funds to double the service to Macomb. Um, it should be more frequent than that. How we get that, we don't know yet, but certainly, um, uh, and that's, uh, that's very important. And then places like Jacksonville, where there should be a high quality bus connection between Quincy, Jacksonville and, and Springfield. And those buses work better if there are trains to meet them so that you've got more volume in the system. Um, and Henry Mason has asked, uh, does anybody know, know why they can't just swap the Metro routes? Um, and it's because there will still be a lot of trains that have to, to cross there because of the desire to get trains from the east and the south to O'Hare and, and to the north. Um, so uh, I kind of took it, we're getting close to the end. Um, I, uh, I'll give it to Chris for questions. Don't feel like you have to stay past one o'clock. So I'll do the official uh, thank you for coming. And, and if we were uh, in, in, uh, in person, you would you know, say, if you wanna go, go. Uh, but we'll stay until, um, until the questions start petering out. So Chris, what questions do we have? Yes, uh, thank you, Rick, and thank you, everyone. Again, um, we have a, a few questions, and if, uh, if people still have others, there's still time to put them in. Um, uh, first of all, uh, there were a couple of uh, people interested in getting the Senate and House bill numbers. Um, I might have missed those. Uh, do we, if we have those, uh, could we get those again? Yes. Um... Senate Bill 4174 and House Bill 5695. And I would mention that any contact that uh, people on this call make with their senators or representatives, uh, it's amazing how, how often bills are brought up that have no contact from constituents of the senator. So even one or two calls from uh, constituency really does make a difference in their awareness and their, their knowing that it is important to their constituents. Senate Bill 4174, House Bill 5695. Great, thank you, Dave. Uh, we also had a question about um, the making these slides or the presentation available uh, afterwards uh, to attendees. And yes, I believe everyone who is here should get an automatic email afterwards that will have a link to a recording uh, that we make uh, as soon as that become available becomes available. But just in case that doesn't happen uh, as planned, uh, you can go to our website anytime, hsrail.org slash events, and we have the recordings of all, all the webinars that we've done over the past year and a half or so there. So, uh, you know, usually it takes a day or two to, uh, to you know, get it uh, posted there, but uh, it, it, it will be there. Um, moving along to some other questions. Um, uh, is uh, this one is uh, uh, about Crossrail. Uh, is, is Crossrail already on the agenda of the city uh, and relevant agencies? Uh, and if not, uh, how can we make that happen or do more to make that happen? Um, so Crossrail is not on the agenda the way we wished it was. We were hoping that the state would have done the prep the uh, planning in time to apply for funds the next time the federal funds came available. Um, it is listed as a potential project, uh, but not funded in the um, long range plan of the local MPO. Uh, the key is um, uh, right now to large, well, 
IDOT needs to hear about all of these things. Um, but in terms of Crossrail, you kind of get narrower down. In addition, uh, the city, uh, so the mayor and the county uh, both play really big roles. Um, so getting the county and the city aldermen involved is very important. Great, thanks. Um, we also had a question from uh, Thomas Dorsey. Um, essentially, was, was money allocated for high-speed rail outside the Northeast? So um, one of the pots of money, actually two of the big pots of money um, for outside of the Northeast uh, are eligible for 186 mile an hour high-speed rail. Um, we were, I was saying we would like there to be a special fund that is dedicated to high-speed rail because then the states will go, oh, wait, there's a dedicated pool of money we can go after. Maybe we should start designing this high-speed line. Um, so that's the distinction there. Okay, thanks. And uh, uh, another question uh, from Henry Mason. Uh, who would operate all of these trains? Um, that is to be determined. Um, so um, it, it could be Metro, it could be Amtrak, it could be another party. Um, there are parts of me that, that uh, still hold on to the idea that uh, the railroads, the BNSF and UP choose to run, uh, run passenger trains under contract. We're going the opposite direction up in, the, up in Chicago. So at this point, that, that's not to not know. Okay. Uh, here, uh, you know, Rick, in the in the course of your talk, you talked about you know some of the uh, the, the corridors that are, are available, uh, and you know owned by different uh, different uh, different companies. Um, and and I guess there's a there was a comment in the chat from William Patterson that I wanted to give you a chance to respond to. Uh, William wrote, "I'd like to see a new relationship with freight rail companies to somehow prioritize passenger rail between Chicago and nearby cities." Uh, for example, uh, to you know, deal with or prevent delays in Indiana. Is that something that you'd like to say more about? Um, so it's to, so probably the most important project between the mountains um, is actually what's called the South of the Lake Reroute um, that would go from Chicago to a point in the country, um, probably a hundred miles east of Chicago in Northern Indiana someplace. And then the routes from Grand Rapids, Lansing, Detroit, Toledo, Cleveland, um, Columbus, perhaps Indianapolis, South Bend, all would funnel into that new dedicated passenger only main line, preferably that has curves that can go really fast and electric wires, et cetera. Um, so that's probably the most important project between Harrisburg and Sacramento. Um, the problem is who owns it? Which agency goes after it? Um, and that's, it's a real toughie. Uh, so I think that's the question that was being asked. Okay. And uh, here is a question from Samuel Traxler. Uh, should there be, you know, we, we talked about uh, O'Hare, um, but what about um, Midway? Should there be express rail service, either Metra or high-speed rail or, or some kind of uh, train service to Midway? Yes, there should, and it's a whole nother kettle of fish. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's in those out years, in the 2040, 2050. But yes, absolutely, there should be a high quality train to Midway. Okay, I think uh, unless I missed anything, and if I did, you know, please send up a flare. But um, I think that uh, between the questions that Rick took right away and the ones that I brought forward, I think that we've covered them all. Well, here's an interesting one about Peoria. So um, let me go back to this map if I can. So this is part of that doing things in phases and, and thinking about your assets and different ways to use them. But for quick start service, the state worked with BNSF to add capacity 
up in Northern Chicago and capacity at Galesburg in order to run the two trains a day from the Quad Cities up to Chicago. And at the beginning, that seemed like a great way to get the service started. Uh, the challenge was it's for the amount of money that it's going to take to actually do it that way, it's not quite worth it for just two trains a day. Um, and as we pointed out, we need to start thinking about a train every two hours. So what I would do if I were king, and this is my opinion, it's nobody else's opinion but mine, is let's get those trains started as soon as possible, in which, which way did it go, going this way, right? And let's get that going. But immediately then think about how we do Peoria, Moline, and I would even add Cedar Rapids into this as a first starter and rebuild all of this. And it's gonna be expensive, very expensive. It's gonna take close cooperation between Metro, Iowa Interstate and CSX. We get that. It's worth doing if you add all of these up. Um, let's get that started now in terms of the planning work. And when that gets done, these two trains a day, and I'm sorry the cursor keeps moving it, instead of going to Quad Cities, maybe they go down at least as far as Galesburg at least not all of Quincy, all, hopefully all the way to Quincy. Um, so that's a way of taking investments and using them in different ways over time. So that's a, we need to start thinking that way about a lot of different things. What can we do today that gets one thing started and maybe it leads to something else later? Great, thank you. And um, we have uh, one more question about the uh, freight railways uh, from Ryan. Uh, regarding the question about the relationship with the freight rail companies, what about the idea of simply paying more per mile? Is that a reasonable idea to promote? Um, absolutely. And I, I have one, if somebody wants to give us, I don't know, a research grant, I would like to do a paper on, well, what are the economics? So we know that faster, more frequent trains will bring more passengers and those passengers will be willing to pay more. How do you use that to justify paying more per mile to the railroad to run the train? I think it's something that somebody should look into. If somebody wants to give us a grant to do that, we'll, we'll have that project done in a year. Um, so. Uh, anything else? I don't think we have any more questions. Okay, going once, going twice. Um, so, um, you know, this takes work. It's all about connecting people. Um, so we are a group of connected people. We're not an organization that's, that's living in an office in Chicago or in a bedroom in uh, Madison. Um, but it takes time and effort to connect those people. So um, we're, we need folks to support this effort. Um, please go to our website, hit the donate key. We want to wrap up very quickly. Um, and we've got some exciting stuff happening right now. So that donate button is critical. Uh, go to highspeedrail.us and click the donate button if you love this program and what we're doing. Um, thank you very much for, for joining us. Thanks, everyone.